So I'm here with Katie Singer, who's a writer for Wall Street International, as well as the book Electronic Silent Spring. And she's going to be talking to us today about the environmental footprint of our internet. Thank you for joining us, Katie. I am so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, a few years ago, I began questioning what it really takes to make a podcast like this one. First, we need electricity. On average, U.S. households use 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy per month. We use this energy to keep lit, to heat and cool, to refrigerate and cook food, wash and dry laundry, keep hot water available, send emails, talk on phones, watch videos, and record and listen to podcasts. How much is 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy? Well, um, next slide, please. One able person can generate 24, hour, 24 kilowatt hours of energy by pedaling a bike generator eight hours a day for 30 days. 20, that's 24 kilowatt hours to generate 1,000 kilowatt hours and to keep electricity available 24 seven, we need servants, an engineer friend calls them slaves, pedaling in eight hour shifts around the clock. We're talking about a total of 300 slaves, including substitutes for everyone to take meal and bathroom breaks. We also need energy and extractions to build the bicycles, the generators, and the batteries, and then grow the food for the servants, store it in a large fridge, cook it, and shelter those 300 people. My friend also wondered, what if one of those slaves wants their own house with 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy available every month? OK, we begin to get the idea. But that monthly calculation of my electricity use does not include the energy or extractions necessary for accessing the internet. Next slide, please. That starts with manufacturing my computer. If we take an introductory level cradle to grave look at what goes into manufacturing a computer, um, I began to grasp the magnitude of this when I learned about embodied energy. Uh, specifically, I'm gonna talk about one part of what is embodied in a computer that's making transistors. Um, transistors process and store data. They provide apps. They do all the things we think are so cool in our computers. One iWatch can have more than a billion transistors. Next slide, please. Transistors are made from silicon, which is an element not found in nature in pure form. Manufacturing silicon typically requires three things. Pure quartz gravel, a carbon, such as petroleum coke, which might come from the tar sands, and hard, dense, moist wood, which could come from the Amazon rainforest. These three things are transported to a smelter that operates at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit for six or seven years at a time. During routine operations, silicon smelters generate toxic waste like carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, carb hydrogen chloride, lead, oxides of nitrogen, particulates, polycyclic arom aromatic hydrocarbons, sulfur dioxide, and sulfuric acid mist. Because interrupting delivery of electricity to a smelter can blow it up, no smelter can be powered by solar or industrial wind facilities which only provide intermittent power. Smelters are powered by natural gas, coal, nuclear, and or hydropower. Okay, please note, manufacturing electronic grade silicon and solar grade silicon for solar panels involves three other energy intensive greenhouse gas emitting toxic waste emitting steps besides the ones I've mentioned here. And these, um, wafers that you see in the slide are, those are, um, th that is pure silicon and it still needs a lot of uh, steps before it becomes transistors for computers. Next slide, please. Copper is another 
big ingredient in our computers. It provides conductors for the circuit board signals. It's usually mined in Chile. For every kilogram of copper mined, at least 210 kilograms of waste are generated. Next slide, please. In, um, so that's a circuit board. Um, in Chinese factories, young people sterilize circuit boards with solvents like N-hexane that cause leukemia and neuromuscular diseases. Next slide, please. For batteries, this is um, cobalt. Cobalt and coltan are mined primarily in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Children have been buried alive mining for cobalt. Next slide, please. This is a four-year-old cobalt miner in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, as for coltan, next slide, please. More people have been murdered over coltan than any other single event since World War II. And since 2000, this is a Grauer gorilla. Um, it has lost 77% of its population, partly because of mining coltan for cell phones. Next slide. Lithium, which is also used for mobile devices and electric vehicle batteries, takes water from communities and farmers. Processing the lithium and discarding the batteries contaminates water supplies. Next slide, please. These Tibetans are protesting the lithium processing near their river. It kills their fish. Next slide, please. Computers, raw materials, and final products get transported between continents on container ships powered by dirty bunker fuel that acidifies oceans. They're also transported on airplanes and trucks and trains. Just think of the energy and extractions embodied in each of these great vehicles. And each great vehicle needs airports, highways, and railroads. Next slide, please. One smartphone has more than 1,000 substances each with its own energy intensive toxic waste emitting supply chain. Next slide. Once I learned all of this, I understood why 81% of a laptop's lifetime energy use will be consumed before the end user turns that laptop on for the first time. Now, this picture shows um, a young man burning electronic waste in order to access the copper, which he could sell for, you know, a little bit of money. Um, and of course, this um, burning is tremendously toxic. It's very dangerous to inhale. And the, the waste impacts the soil, the water, and all the living creatures nearby. Electronics do not biodegrade. They are hazardous waste. This podcast also depends on infrastructure. So next slide, please. To transmit and receive my presentation here, our computers need access networks. Access networks are made up of cables, satellites, routers, antennas, modems, and battery backup systems. They are huge energy guzzlers. These pictures show mobile networks. The one on the right shows a 5G cell site, and of course, um, with 5G, the access networks are getting closer and closer to our homes. Storing my PowerPoint and the podcast for replay, we need data centers. Next slide, please. In 2012, Greenpeace reported that if data centers were a country, they would rank fifth in energy use. Their electricity use grows by about 20% each year. From floor to ceiling, Data centers are covered with servers and cooling systems that are replaced about every three years. I just read about a new data center in Arizona. It will consume 1.25 million gallons of water every day to operate the cooling systems. Next slide, please. I should mention that, the, uh, well, I'm, let me mention the Jevons paradox. It explains that energy efficiency actually increases energy consumption and extraction. Here's the deal. When manufacturers make billions of new computers for individuals and data centers and hundreds of thousands of new cell sites, they could be energy efficient 
but they're still going to have to mine ores and make chemicals and transport those raw materials. And in the process, they're increasing extraction and energy use and toxic waste and greenhouse gas emissions. So energy efficiency increases energy use and extraction. I think the focus needs to be on reducing our consumption and reducing our overall extraction. Um, so that's my general thing. And um, I, I should stop here, Theodora. I know you have questions and or, or just observations. I, I'm <laughs> welcome hearing, yeah. Well, we have been working on raising awareness on this. And I guess my first question is, so how do we start? Let's talk about national and international ways to begin to tackle this and then talk about personal and things we can do at home. But how do we begin this process? Because it sure feels overwhelming. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Um, it, so what I've offered here is an introductory level life cycle analysis of let's just say this podcast, what it takes for this podcast. When you go to buy a new computer, you might, um, it might say energy efficient on it or something like that. Um, you might think that it's green and clean because all you're seeing is the screen. At a national level and at international levels, we need life cycle analysis built into every product that we buy. So we need to start requiring life cycle analysis. We need to define terms like green, sustainable, renewable, zero emitting, carbon neutral, zero waste. At this point, these terms are just marketing tools. Um, we need to recognize the cradle to grave impacts of every manufactured good. And as a model, um, in food, there are requirements with the term organic. There are not requirements when people, when manufacturers or food producers use the term pure or natural. But with organic, there are some limits. I can't say that um, I like them 100%, but there are some limits. Right. So, so again, we need that with manufacturers of equipment. And then we need to recognize that with the addition of every level of infrastructure, like going from 4G to 5G, there are massive consequences all along the chain and we need to prioritize. Okay, is that what we value more? Having a speedier uh, access, although Miguel Coma can report that 5G, for example, will not increase speed. Um, but right. we, we need discussion of that. And then we need to say, or is it our priority to, to stick with what we have and find ways to keep that in good repair and use it as, as well as we can? Well, with Those, 5G, they're putting a layer on top of, of this new technology that's going to rely on everything else we have. And from what I understand, they already have 6 and 7G waiting in the wings. It just seems like it's never ending how fast the, the movement is with no concern for our sustainability. So, so we need to prioritize that at national and international levels. What, what are really, um, are, are, are we aiming to reduce energy use overall? Are we aiming to reduce extractions overall? Are we aiming to respect the integrity of indigenous communities and to inform people who, you know, like I'm looking out my window right now, I don't see a problem. I don't see smoke, like, cause I don't have an electronic waste dump near me, like that picture that I showed from Ghana. Um, I don't have a smelter nearby, but lots of people do. So we need to 
keep educating ourselves and we need policies that actually limit production of manufactured goods and development of new infrastructure. Right. Um, there are many other things, wherever ores are mined, we need to require contracts that provide communities um, a sufficient compensation and B the ability to end mining or disassemble facilities if they elect to do that. Um, we need ethical certification of mined and smelted ore. So, so manufacturers need to prove that the, the raw materials that go into their computers is, ha, has been ethically mined and assembled those kinds of things. Um, we, I, I should also explain that recycling needs, we, we need to know a lot more about recycling. It is also a toxic waste emitting energy intensive greenhouse gas emitting process. It might be better than uh, mining for new stuff, but it, it's still, a very toxic process and a very intense energy intensive process. I don't even know if we are, where are our electronics going now? I know they were going to Asia and now that China's saying no, yeah. are they going to Africa or South America and they're informally recycled and the whole thing is a complete mess as far as every time I've looked at the reports on this, what is the update on the actual ability to even recycle? these electronics? Well, okay, you've said a bunch of things. So first of all, a very small percentage of our electronics get recycled. Right. Mm -hmm. For me, the most important issue is that that 81% figure I gave earlier, the vast majority of energy and waste occur before the end user turns the device on for the first time. So, you know, we can, like when we have a computer that's no longer usable, we see it. And we have electronic waste days in our communities. We see that. That is a small, small part of the waste generated by every, every manufactured item. Okay. And that, that we, you know, one, I read that with one computer, or one, div, one substance in a computer, it can travel between 12 different countries before it goes into the final product. That begins to give you an idea of the international supply chains involved in all these substances. And again, one smartphone has more than a thousand substances. And so, more than a million transistors? Oh, billions. Billion one iWatch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One iWatch will have, yeah, 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 yeah. We're talking billions per iWatch. Right. And so, found. so all of that happens before you turn your computer on for the first time. That's the kind of waste that we need to think about. And the recycling is, um, it matters, it is adding up, but it is so small in comparison to what goes into each of our devices. And, and we haven't talked about what goes into the infrastructure. We've only just begun. We've only just <laughs> begun. And e-waste itself is a ever growing critically important problem and all of the pollution from the the burning of those like you talked about but right. then the informal recycling and the communities that are being poisoned who are poisoned at the front end and the back end and then the and oh. and i can't say enough about the impact of cargo shipping whether you're shipping mm -hmm. raw materials before they get to the assembly plant or the final product to the end user or the end of life, no longer usable computers and printers that are then going probably at this point to Africa. I've not heard of Africa, ref, you know, countries in Africa yeah. refusing them, but I don't know. Um, or to recycling centers. All of that shipping 
is really energy intensive. I think a few years ago, if cargo shipping were a country, it would rank sixth in greenhouse gas emissions. And that is affecting our oceans also mm -hmm. because of the kind of fuel that the cargo ships use. So really what's going on is we need to rethink the big picture and then talk about, okay, how do we start to reduce household by household as well as country by country. So tell me about household by household. Oy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you're asking very simple, big questions. Um, so now that you understand a little about what is embodied in every computer, you would understand that every time you buy something new, you're entering into that international global super factory that is toxic waste emitting, greenhouse gas emitting, energy intensive. Right. So we want to limit that as much as possible. So even if you say you buy a new software program so that you can do more efficient podcasts, great. Well, you might need it might not be compatible with the computer you have. So you need to upgrade the computer. And then your upgraded computer might not work with your old printer. So then you need to buy a new printer. And you see how you've stepped into that international supply chain of guzzling raw materials. So you want to delay buying anything new as long as possible. I've read that you want to wait at least four years before you upgrade anything. And this is not easy to do as, you know, we've got children needing computers in order to attend school, all that stuff, and people working at home. It, it goes on and on. But just, just knowing what you're stepping into when you buy something new is, is helpful. I like what the um, Chris Rowan says. She, she does wonderful workshops for children and says, no electronics for children until reading, writing, and math are mastered on paper. I do find it's a great idea and implementing it is something else. But I think if parents can come together, even a little bit of limit on what we give children is is really important. Um, I think if each of us can ask, okay, can I have a video budget? Video is one of the worst, one of the major energy guzzlers we've got. And we're using it right now for this podcast. That's right. But if we can limit our own video use and say, okay, I'm gonna limit myself to say, you know, X number of hours per week. And then if I do more than that, that's too much. I'm going to be have, I'll have to go into taking um, from, you know, a future week, but we need to really watch our video use and limit it. Um, as much as we can ask for modular electronics where parts are replaceable and easily repairable, that would be great. Like ink cartridges, for example. Um, there, there's so much, and I think we, we just need to talk with each other with this question and, and start from a place of realizing that we all need education, and I'm at the top of that list of even though I've been in this for more than 20 years, I feel like I still learn major things every single day that just astound me. And I need a lot of help learning how to limit my own use. You um, know, one of the things that, that young people are doing, and I have two teenage daughters, um, one who's not going to be a teenager for long, but they FaceTime, they don't talk anymore. You know, when I was a kid, I used to be on the phone for hours, I did everything with that phone to my head. It was a corded landline at the time, but now the kids are just FaceTiming. So they're not even moving. 
and they just stare at the screen, but it's a video. And if they're out, just out, they FaceTime too. <laughs> so here's, here's what I would say, um, because I've met, I, I have relationships with a lot of these teenagers that you're talking about. And my sense is that they really care about their future and the earth. They do. Mm -hmm. And so if they can learn some of the stuff that I've just presented here, mm -hmm. and then they are the experts, I want to know what they think we should do to, to reduce our consumption. And yeah, and what do they think is too much consumption? And what do they think would be, say, three things to do to reduce overall <laughs> consumption? So and how do they pressure companies? Because we that ultimately, just like anything else, right? The personal is the political, and we have to put the pressure on the companies to change and make the, there's probably software and hardware changes that can sort of be easy, like low hanging fruit that can do um, some of this to start, yeah, yeah. not the embodied yeah. energy. I haven't got, I'm talking about the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the user. Okay, so I, um, a few months ago, I, so again, one smartphone has more than a thousand substances. Mm -hmm. I've listed about a hundred of those substances. And my idea is that if each user could research the supply chain of one substance and then share that with classmates, coworkers, family members, we would begin to have enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so, so let's start with one substance in whatever device you're using and research it and then um, start sharing that with other people who are interested to know that uh, um yes be I do. a great high school or middle school project like i or about or college project and oh. i have i can you um i'll send you my article about that with the list of substances you can link yeah. it as part of the podcast um yeah, that, I think that's a great school project. And, but it's also good for businesses that are committed to reducing their consumption. The first step is to get informed. And then, yes, I love the idea of pressuring manufacturers, but the problem is so massive at this point. Right. And, um, and, and we're, we're really going to need a lot of people involved in substantial conversation about how we can stick with what we have and reduce, reduce our consumption. There's another really big problem we haven't talked about. There are so many elephants in the room, but about 3 billion people do not have internet access about the same number don't have access to clean water or toilets. What is our priority? Do we want to get these people clean water and toilets or do we want them online? And if they go online and then they have access to educational opportunities and economic opportunities, that will have ramifications for our ecosystems and <laughs> for everything. So, so we, you know, what's, what's fair? Are, are those of us who are privileged enough to have the computers we need to access this podcast, are we going to, how are we going to reduce what we have in order to balance what is not had by, you know, half of the population on, on the planet? Right. These are such important questions. I am really glad to speak with you. And I look forward, we're going to do some more. I'm really glad for that. Thank you. We are. We need to do more about this. We need to bring the issue of what is sustainable technology. I mean, if we don't start, what should I say, designing it ourselves, it's going to, it's already designing us. It's, they're already defining a green this and green that, total greenwashing when it comes to tech. And uh, there's so much to do here, but we have to parse it out with a, like what are the three takeaways you want people to leave with that feels manageable? 
Um, <laughs> so I'll say, just check out, so, so we're going to link to this article I wrote where I list 100 substances in a smartphone. And just dare yourself to learn about one of those substances and then to find a way to share it. Also, see if you can, um, when I, it's another story, but I gave myself the goal of reducing my consumption by 3% per month, my overall energy consumption. And that was, you know, it was fun for a while. And then I realized I, I needed involvement with many other people in my community for it to become more substantial. But you can just start by asking yourself, okay, what would I reduce to begin reducing my consumption? And maybe it's watching an hour less video per week or something like that, you know, whatever it is, start by reducing your own consumption. And then see if you can do activities that you really like without an electronic interface. So for example, I haven't used a dryer for a few years. And I have to tell you, I really like hanging my laundry outside on the line. And there it is. I don't, I don't have to use an electric device, um, an electric appliance. So see if you can find activities that you can do without an electronic interface. And, and even without your phone attached to you, and on all the time, which seems to be like popular, a shocking concept. But I would say, but I would say start small. Start so, small. so like maybe for an hour a week, you could leave your house without your phone. So, so just, yeah, just start small right. instead of changing your whole life. Um, yeah, start small. It's possible it, to all who are listening because I haven't turned on my phone and I can't even think of when it was last on actually in the more recent. Okay, but but month. once you've um, <laughs> once you've habituated to it, then you then it's harder. It's it that's the same thing with infrastructure. It's like once right. we have this infrastructure, cutting back on it or eliminating it is really hard. Yeah, I think this issue of how do we, I mean, especially with the pandemic and everyone online, and I'm certainly online a lot and in meetings a lot, and there's a lot to shift here. I guess before we end, can you tell us about the, um, the website and how many articles that you have done with Miguel sure. so people can find out more and access those? Yes. So... Um, and Wall Street International is based in Europe, mm -hmm. and they started publishing my articles about nature and technology, and Miguel Comas, um, he's an, uh, basically a, um, an engineer, he's called an IT architect in Europe. Um, he's worked with telecom corporations and design and he's, he, he's, he's an engineer. <laughs> and he's been writing about 5G's energy use. He has a fabulous critique of Huawei's claim that 5G is green and clean. Um, he has just wonderful insights about 5G. So we've done a total of 25 articles at this point. They're all available at our web dot tech that's o u r w e b dot t e c h forward slash letters plural so our web dot tech forward slash letters and we keep adding to them and you asked me another question and now i can't remember i um, think that was it about the okay. articles where we can find them yeah people who are listening and, and, and I'll say number three is the one that lists the substances in one smartphone. Yeah. 
thank you so much, Katie. And I'm oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I look forward to talking to you again, and we'll be putting this online and all of these podcasts online. And Theodore Scarato, Executive Director with Environmental Health Trust. Thank you.